Good afternoon on today's Angry Bulletin. As many of you are probably aware, Rocket Factory Augsburg is working on a commercial resupply ship for the International Space Station and for future space stations as well. But in a recent and rather shocking teaser, RFA is also suggesting that they might possibly be getting into the human spaceflight business. Can the Argo carry people? And if so, how would it do it? And what are the advantages that this spacecraft offers to European astronauts in the future? All of this and more coming at you on The Angry Astronaut right now. Good afternoon and once again, welcome to another episode of The Angry Astronaut, a bulletin that, once again, I was not planning on putting out right at the moment, given the fact that I have talked about Rocket Factory Augsburg fairly recently. And by the way, if you have not seen that exclusive interview, well, you definitely need to check it out, and it's linked both in the description and at the end of this video. But here's what's so exciting about what they've been announcing lately. The Argo, as many of you know, although I think a lot of you probably don't, is RFA's answer to a European Space Agency challenge. ESA put out a request for proposals to private European companies with the objective of building a cargo resupply ship for the ISS and for future space stations, the Starlab space station being one of the more obvious destinations simply because Airbus is so heavily involved in that project at this point. But regardless of the destination, the objective was to have a low-cost, reusable cargo resupply ship. No discussion was made of there being crew or human-rated spacecraft. However, the companies that have been responding are definitely demonstrating that they're interested in providing a human-rated spacecraft along with a cargo resupply ship. Why is this the case? Well, the reasons are obvious. The European Space Agency puts out a graduating class of astronauts maybe once every 10 years. It really doesn't happen very often. Sometimes a little bit more frequently than that, but never does a single country have an opportunity to put more than one astronaut on the active duty list. One astronaut from each country at best gets an opportunity to go to space maybe once a decade, as is the case here in Britain and elsewhere. That's absolutely ridiculous and doesn't give Europe much of an opportunity to put their citizens into space, but it's a necessity because NASA only has so many seats available on any of the ships that they are sending up to the ISS at any given time. And even with Axiom Space providing alternatives, providing an opportunity for private missions up to the ISS, nevertheless, that's a very expensive expensive option, and there's only one company doing it, and only one company providing the transportation, that of course being SpaceX. Europe clearly wants to have an alternative. They want a European company to provide transportation alternatives up to orbit and elsewhere. For the first time ever, the European Space Agency is getting heavily into the manned spaceflight business, at least as far as their plans are concerned. So the competitors in this contract that ESA has for a resupply ship, these competitors are also talking about human-rated solutions for their spacecraft as well. For example, the Exploration Company, which is a combined French and German initiative, this company has always talked about their spacecraft as being a human-rated ship as well as a resupply ship, a ship that could actually, theoretically, put human beings on the surface of the moon might be a great alternative for HLS in case some problems come up with Lunar Starship. But now, Rocket Factory Augsburg appears to be getting into the game as well, with a very interestingly timed and very subtle little teaser that they've provided recently. So, what is the Argo? 
What can the Argo actually do, and how could it become a human-rated spacecraft? Would it be the same as Crew Dragon? Would it have any advantages or disadvantages? And what rocket would it possibly fly on? So for the first part of this video, I'm going to quote extensively from RFA's Ultimate Guide to Argo, which is sort of a Q&A blog that they did for the spacecraft. People could ask whatever questions they wanted. So let's go ahead and get started. Meet Argo, our cost-effective space cargo capsule. Optimized for flexibility and reliability, Argo offers an end-to-end -end service at a low price point of just 150 million euros. That's actually about $50 million less than SpaceX currently charges for Cargo Dragon. Led by RFA, the bidding consortium combines our expertise from that with the Space Cargo Unlimited, along with partners like Atmos Space Cargo, to offer a fully reusable solution for the European Space Agency and for commercial clients. So let's go ahead and plunge right into these questions. Question number one, which rocket will launch Argo into space? Well, according to the requirements of ESA, Argo is developed for use on any launcher. At a minimum, it is compatible with current and future European medium to heavy lift launch vehicles, which of course is just the Ariane 6. There are no other medium to heavy lift launch vehicles for Europe, but it can also fly with other medium or heavy lift launch vehicles if needed. In other words, things like Falcon 9, Falcon Heavy, etc. This approach makes Argo launch agnostic and capable of offering a 100% flexible and customer-oriented service. However, question number two, will Argo launch on an RFA-built launch vehicle? Although Argo is compatible with other existing and upcoming launchers, the most cost-effective solution would be to launch on our very own medium or heavy lift launch system. This enables us to offer a full end-to-end -end cargo service for four metric tons to and from orbit. As one person pointed out, RFA-1 is indeed too small to carry Argo, but that was never our plan. ESA's requirement is that we must launch Argo by 2028, and by then, the European Launcher Challenge will presumably provide the framework for the development of a larger RFA rocket. So yeah, it appears that RFA is planning on having a larger rocket by 2028. So we move step by step and start with our RFA-1, which you'll know is due to launch in summer of 2024 and is already fully booked for its first two test flights. So what about the annual launch cadence for Argo? Well, during our market research, we found a substantial global demand for cargo transportation missions. After its first demo mission in 2028, we plan to make the service commercially available from 2029 onward, with the aim to increase cadence as needed to serve the market. So let's get down to designs and specifications. What are the dimensions of Argo? It's 3.7 meters in diameter and 7.7 .7 meters long without its fairing. It will have a one-to-one -one ratio between its up and down cargo mass, one of its most unique features. What does that mean? Well, it means that it can carry as much down cargo-wise as it can transport up to orbit. Yeah, that is a very unusual capability indeed. How do we achieve this same ratio? With an inflatable atmospheric decelerator provided by our partner Atmos Space Cargo. Presumably, this innovative heat shield is going to allow this particular spacecraft to bring a lot more cargo down from orbit than previous spacecraft can. Granted, Cargo Dragon can bring a pretty substantial amount, but this spacecraft will be able to bring more more even than the Sierra Space Dream Chaser. The main structural elements of Argo can easily be scaled in a fast and cheap way. Using our building block approach, it's possible to add segments to the existing capsule. We can also scale the propulsion system and propellant storage with minimal charges elsewhere, making Argo more flexible for future space stations in low Earth orbit. Now here comes some very interesting details. What is the internal volume in cargo capacity? 
Argo has a dry mass of 5,200 kilograms without cargo, a total internal pressurized volume of 27.9 cubic meters, and a pressurized cargo volume of 15.5 cubic meters. 15.5. That may not sound like a lot, but that's actually 50% more pressurized volume than either Cargo Dragon or Crew Dragon, meaning that, in theory, this spacecraft could provide 50% more volume to any potential astronauts that might travel on it in the future. Obviously, you can't put astronauts on a cargo ship, but nevertheless, that's a very interesting detail. That's a lot of pressurized volume. So what powers this spacecraft? Well, two RFA Phoenix engines. By the way, that's another thing I really like about RFA is the fact that they're using all of this internally designed technology. They're not outsourcing much of anything except with a couple of trusted partners. So two RFA Phoenix engines will power it in orbit, plus 24 100 Newton thrusters for the reaction control system. The Phoenix engines, by the way, are Methalox engines. How long can Argo stay in space? Well, the demo mission in 2028 will last for a total of 25 days. Argo will spend three of those days getting to the ISS, 20 days docked, and a further two days for undocking, re-entry, and recovery. However, Argo is designed to service our customers and their needs. Therefore, it's possible for Argo to remain in orbit for over a year if required. So does that mean that this can be used for space stations apart from the ISS? And what about in-orbit experiments? Well, obviously, the spacecraft is designed for a wide variety of private space stations, and Argo can also be used for in-orbit experiments with or without docking to the ISS or any other space station. Specifically, Argo can induce spin to generate up to Martian gravity along the cylindrical hull of the pressure vessel, meaning that it can generate its own artificial gravity, but only for experimental purposes. And by the way, if you want to talk about these in-orbit experiments that Argo could be involved in, well, obviously they're going to be doing a lot of collaboration with Atmos on that, because Atmos has a different spacecraft called the Phoenix that's going to be carrying out a wide variety of microgravity experiments in low Earth orbit, and this will be deployed deployed initially by the RFA-1, with larger versions being deployed in the future by heavier launch vehicles. But it's clear that Atmos and RFA intend to conduct the types of microgravity experiments that could lead to 3D printed organs, various types of space-based pharmaceuticals, essentially revolutionizing it, manufacturing and 3D printing, even biological 3D printing, in orbit. RFA is riding on the bleeding edge of the space industry and they're bringing their partners along for the ride. Now here's one of the most interesting questions. Can the Argo be used for any sorts of missions outside of low Earth orbit? Well, Argo is specifically optimized for LEO. However, the preliminary analysis that RFA did with the design did not find any showstoppers for modifying the trajectory and or decelerator for re-entry after departing from the lunar gateway. So who knows what could happen in the future? It is obvious that RFA intends to use this spacecraft for lunar resupply as well. Incidentally, you're seeing Atmos's inflatable heat shield in action here with a Phoenix reusable space vehicle, and that is something that is undoubtedly going to be used for the Argo as well, although I'm pretty sure they're going to use parachutes in conjunction with the inflatable heat shield, not slamming it into the ocean as depicted here. So what makes this spacecraft superior to the competition? Well, the bottom line is the inflatable heat shield. That is one of the biggest advantages. This technology enables the uniqueness of using a stainless steel cylindrical capsule. It is this benefit that makes us different thanks to three commercial factors. Competitive service price point starting at 150 million euros, equal up and down cargo ratio of 
four metric tons and offering a fully integrated end-to-end service with an RFA launch system. Given that they are talking about that as being one of the biggest advantages, it is obvious that RFA intends to build a bigger rocket than RFA-1 soon. So is there a roadmap? Well, yes. From the start, we envisioned Argo as more than just a cargo delivery system to low Earth orbit. Together with our partners, we have created a detailed roadmap on how further capabilities can be achieved in a reasonable time frame. If you're asking what exactly that roadmap is, well, you'll just have to wait and see. And here's Future Angry making a correction because I missed one of these questions. I was wrong about parachutes. This is perhaps the most innovative thing about this spacecraft of all, although I'm pretty certain that this would not work at all for a human-rated spacecraft. But the question is, have you started parachute testing? The answer? The beauty of Argo is that parachutes are not needed. The inflatable atmospheric decelerator fully covers re-entry and deceleration prior to splashdown in the ocean. This is simply astonishing, and I can't wait to see this technology in action. As I said, I'm sure that's something that wouldn't work with human-rated spacecraft, but given the fact that there are sensitive experiments on these spacecraft from time to time, it can't just slam into the ocean at full speed, so this thing has got to get the velocity down substantially. So the bottom line is this, RFA is working on a vehicle that's designed to compete directly with Cargo Dragon. And like Cargo Dragon, it has the potential to be modified into a human-rated spacecraft. And like Cargo Dragon, it is obvious that RFA intends to eventually make a human-rated spacecraft, most probably using this as the basis. Because after all, why would you have 15.5 cubic meters of pressurized volume? and virtually no unpressurized volume if you didn't intend to eventually use it to carry humans. Really looking forward to new updates from RFA and I will bring those updates to you as quickly as I receive them. In the meantime, I would like to thank Brian Schmidt and Todd Trowbridge, the latest of the 23 new Patreon members that have joined up over the last 28 days in March. Thank you so much. It makes such an enormous difference to my channel, especially given the fact that I am going to be attending the Space Symposium in Colorado Springs that is the biggest space-related convention in the United States. So looking forward to it, and really, all I have to do is pay for a plane ticket. That's it. Everything else is pretty much covered. So if you would like to support my visit to the Space Symposium, all the details are in the description. Thank you very much for watching. Please like, please subscribe, and as always, stay angry about space.